so if you have questions please write it in the uh, chat box and uh, most of the time please unmute your microphone so that we can uh, focus on the speakers i think now i will hand the microphone to father petro Wolpo. so father petro thank you uh, could you unmute yes thank you yes uh, good morning can you hear me wonderful to gather this morning. Um, we're looking at COVID obviously, but we're looking at the two uh, universal apostolic preferences to accompany young people in the creation of a hope-filled future. And second, to collaborate in the care of our common home. So I'm asking you as you join this meeting, to start thinking of the questions you're finding in your own apostolic work and uh, to listen to our two, two speakers this morning, um, Sue, uh, Sue Martin and Lisa Burji uh, Astuti. Yeah? Um, let me just say something about the two speakers, and before I do, may I wish uh, Christina Keng a happy birthday, and uh, I hope uh, this meeting and tomorrow will be a memorable occasion for you. Um, some uh, accompaniment and gratitude uh, for all uh, the life and times you've spent with us. So, uh, may you have a good year ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so if I may introduce our first speaker, Sue Martin, she brings with her greater expertise and commitment to ecology and Ignatian spirituality. Her current and recent roles include reconciliation with creation, project officer, for the Australian province. Um, she's assistant JCAP reconciliation with creation coordinator. Um, and uh, she works with the global Echo Jesuit team. Previously, Sue worked with, with the, the Sustainability, Sustainability Center, Center coordinator at St. Ignatius, Ignatius College, College Riverview, uh, starting, starting in 2009. And, and she, she has worked, worked closely, closely with Being with, with God in Nature Ministry team since its inception. It is about responding to Laudato Si, connecting people to their local environment, finding God in the other, and caring for our common home. As long as I have known Sue, environmental education is the primary focus of her work and her calm and caring ways to regenerate the landscape sustains the hope and the heart of the youth. So, welcome, Sue. And if I may just introduce Lisa so that then they can both uh, uh, present their PowerPoint. Um, Ms. Lisa is a doctoral student at the University of Vienna. Uh, and she lectures at Atma Jaya University, Jakarta. Her dissertation topic, interestingly, is social media literacy for young people as influencers in Indonesia. Uh, around 2010, she was a member of the Magis community in Yogyakarta. Uh, starting 2017, uh, she's a member of the Committee of the Youth Commission for the Indonesian Bishops Conference. Um, and she's also now an animator of the Young Catholic Students Indonesia Movement in Leadership. There are five campus ministers, uh, members from Jakarta, Pontianak, Kupang, Ende, and Manado. It's an international movement that's 
centered in Paris and has an Asian center in the Philippines. So without any further uh, introduction, um, each speaker has 25 minutes, then we will take a break for 10 minutes where you can start to prepare your questions. So thank you. Can the screening be shared with Sue so that she may begin? Thank you, Pedro, for those kind words. And I um, feel privileged to be um, sharing with you all today. I hope that my screen has come through. Um, yes. Yes, good. And I do come to you as part of a team with um, Miss Sylvia and Father Gabby. And I want to acknowledge that I am part of um, a team effort to share our dream for a just, sustainable and inclusive future of our society after COVID-19. I want to start by acknowledging country, which is what we do in Australia. Jamna, Payala, Midigo, Darug. Nugbai, Duba, Baradu, Bidja, Biria, Burupai. We talk to our friends, Darug. We love ground and water here today and tomorrow. And for me, it is about learning from First Peoples because if we don't look after country, country will not look after us. But I do want to start with prayer. And for me, this prayer um, gives me hope and it is about seeking God's spirit poured into our hearts to make the sentiments and justice and care for creation take root in us who are, co who are called to be prophets of the modern era. I do also want to acknowledge that I come to you with many, many, many um, mentors helping me, uh, Pedro being one of them, um, my Reconciliation with Creation team in Australia, Laurie and Lisa and um, the, the amazing Peter Saunders and, and all who have uh, formed us as we get to this point uh, to share with you our... Uh, hopes and dreams for looking after our common home. In my short time with you, I will try and cover how COVID has affected our common home in Asia Pacific and the emerging and new situations regarding our ecological concern in the Asia Pacific and our implications, opportunities, priorities and demands that we in our Reconciliation with Creation team call on for our mission. But I do want to begin to acknowledge that my worldview is formed from the place where I am and that's Australia. And I do want to acknowledge that for me, that global north is a place of privilege and um, maybe not as exposed to uh, COVID is a huge implication in Australia, but I please want to acknowledge that for uh, many across our our um, provinces, the challenges are, are great. And I also want you to think about what's your worldview. And for, for me, it is trying to move from that traditional anthropocentric human-centered view to move us to being an ecocentric, earth-centered view with us as connected with all in creation.
I am going to start uh, with a story and share with you a um, parable. And I share with you my place. And my place there is a photo from the Jesuit house at Jeroa. If any of you have visited Australia, the scene might be familiar. My story, who is my neighbour? The parable of the Good Samaritan retold from an ecological perspective. Love of God and love of neighbour is at the heart of our Christian life and at the heart of gospel message. With, with this in mind, I invite you to listen with new ears to a well-known gospel parable. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbour as well as yourself. Jesus said to him, you have the right answer, do this and you will live. Wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, who is my neighbour? Jesus replied, there once was a balanced ecosystem where all kinds of life forms and species lived together in a community of independent relationships. It was an unspoiled piece of earth, pulsating with energy and life. Now this pristine environment fell into the hands of some human beings who walked upon it with heavy footprints. They stripped it of its trees. They covered its green expanse with conglomerates of concrete and steel and glass. They polluted its waterways and its airways. They ransacked its resources and went away leaving it struggling to sustain any kind of life. It lay dying. Now by chance some other human beings came along to this now ravished part of Earth. They belonged to the world of big business. They were concerned about productivity and profits at any cost. They too walked with heavy, heavy footprints. They dug deeper and deeper into the earth. They plundered what little was left of its resources. They took no notice of its cries. When there was no more profit to be made, they passed it by. So likewise, another group of human beings came to this patch of earth. They looked upon this struggling ecosystem. They saw only the degradation and depleted resources. They had no appreciation of the beauty of the earth. Their vision was empty. They did not notice the signs of life, the tiny creatures and resilient plant life clinging with fragile hope to what remained of this once vibrant place. They saw nothing of value on this trampled earth. They too passed on by with heavy footprint. After a while, along came some determined and concerned human beings committed to making meaningful change. They walked with gentle footprints upon the earth. They looked and listened and were moved by compassion. They took the earth and bandaged it with reverence and love. They poured upon it the oil and wine of restoration and rejuvenation. They took the earth to a place of sustainable and responsible stewardship. They made a covenant to take care of the earth, to make reparation for the exploitative past, to change their consumerist habits and to live with heightened awareness within the web of life. Which of these human beings acted as a neighbour to our ecosystem that fell into the hands of the environmental robbers and exploitative human beings? The lawyer said, the ones who heard the cries of the earth and looked upon it with compassion and love. Jesus said, go and do likewise. 
for me, that is a story of what caring for our common home is for. And I hope for you, a reflection is, is um, something that can re resonate deeply in your prayer life. But I do want to share that um, how ecology is being affected by COVID. And it is really that the stresses on earth are still there. They're not changing. But it is a time of pause. It is a time to reflect and um, think about our place. It is a time of change, change in the way we um, look at our uh, working with our communities and connecting with, with country. But really, it is for us that nothing has changed. I want to share with you, it's not about threatened species, but about threatened landforms. And just share with you my fears for our um, caring for home. And think about it's about threatened landforms, our glaciers and coral reefs, just to name two landforms. So for us in Australia, it is the Great Barrier Reef that is our, our um, fear of, of losing as a whole system. And recently we've had um, two or even three bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef. And I share with you Terry Hughes, who is a leading uh, Great Barrier Reef scientist. And his comment when seeing the results of the bleaching, I showed the results of the aerial surveys on the Great Barrier Reef to my students, and then we wept. So it is a time for us uh, working to care for our common home, that it, it is a, a time of lament. And for me, I lament that the great water tower in Asia, what will happen when that is gone, when, the, when those glaciers have finished melting? And we don't know when that will be, but for me, that lament and fear of what that will mean for us as uh, communities relying on that water will be um, something that needs to be uh, in our minds and in our mission. But working in this space, I do want to share that change is hard we need to have big system shifts. And maybe it's COVID that is that point that is allowing us to consider a pivotal shift. It's a hope. And I do love what Frank Turner reflected on in, in thinking about our post-COVID world. We shall need the experience that we are more, politically speaking, than um, taxpayers, more economically speaking than producers and consumers. And to know that we are citizens of, or not, we are neither individuals nor sectoral dialogues, but persons living in community. And I just love that notion that we are, that it's about our community that we need to build and work with. And thinking about post COVID and the conversations in our reconciliation with creation team, we've had, we've been talking about um, post COVID and um, building on the conversations that are happening in our, our um, mainstream media. 
and I share with you Antonio Guterres from um, United Nations. It's a time to save the sick and to rescue the planet. It's the time for clo closer cooperation among nations. We could stop the pandemic faster and slow climate change. So it's putting that notion that we need to be in this together to, um, to, to look at what our future could be. And for me, um, various models need to think about um, growth and growth within limits. And so a colleague of mine, um, Hayden Washington and Michelle Maloney. Michelle Maloney is part of the Earth, Law, Earth Laws Alliance and are looking to think about what a new, new models could be for our world. And I know um, with Europe, Europe um, pushing for green economies, um, I share this with you thinking about what we could be um, looking at post COVID. Is it a steady state economy? Is it the donut economy? Some things to think about. I'm now sharing with you um, the calls on us thinking about caring for our common home and that call on leaving the Anthropocene. So that thinking that um, Thomas Berry calls about um, living in an ecozoic community and Glenn Albright, who's an Australian environmental philosopher, con um, pioneered the concept of solastasia, that lived experience of negative environmental change. And for me, that is something for us to um, uh, understand that environmental change is, is happening around us. And Glenn calls for a new age for us to work towards the symbiocene, where we work in um, symbio, we work uh, communally and um, in symbiosis with the with all. And for me, that worldview of um, being ecocentric um, sits really nicely here. And I share with you Bill Mollison, whose grandson works with us in our eco hub, in um, eco justice hub, out of our Jesuit social services uh, work in Melbourne. And in his paper, The Collapse, Capitalism Collapse, I just love that we need to recognise that life will be much better afterwards. We're just in transition. Our creativity is the limit of the system. And for us as Jesuits, it's that creativity that I know can come to the fore. Richard Louvre um, drives much of the work as we, for us environmental educators in that notion of nature deficit disorder and that need to be close to nature and bring, up, bring that connection to nature into all that we do. And Hayden Washington, who is that um, amazing academic working in uh, new economies, talks about it is the need for wonder and awe, which is our um, spiritual life coming to the fore. So it is our, um, our implications, our opportunities, our prior priorities are that we do educate, act and advocate and find a space where they all interact. But working with our reconciliation with creation team in Australia, 
it is acknowledged that before we can build our mission, we actually need to build our discipleship. And I love this um, notion from the global Catholic climate movement, where it's about the need for internal transformation and that spiritual dimension to undergo ecological conversion that Pope John Paul II the second coined so long ago. And it is about then moving into that external transformation, but it does start with the internal. So what are our conversion opportunities on a personal, communal and institutional uh, level? For us, it is the being with God in nature ministry. And, and I see lots of opportunity and um, growth, I hope, for this across Asia Pacific, our, our conference, that being with God in nature can grow. It is making sure we um, work with those that are, are working in this space, the Sustainable Development Goals, and knowing that these need to be the basis of all that we do. And it is acknowledging that the eco, our eco-Jesuit team has gathered uh, dialogue from across the conferences. And these are the seven priorities that have been identified. And it is about food security. It is about building resilience. It is about um, being net zero. It is about understanding ecological economies. It is, is about Laudato Sea and uh, connecting with that uh, push from um, Pope John Paul, Pope Francis. It is about leadership and it is about ecological conversion. So for me, uh, working with what eco-Jesuit have been um, building and forming uh, is, is our way forward. So our mission for me is to um, acknowledge uh, Laudato Sea as a place to um, build our Laudato Sea communities across our uh, province. It is about building back better. It is about acknowledging that we need just finance. So our justice work needs to go across all that we do. And it is about being net zero by 2030 or whatever date we choose. And um, I'll finish there by thinking that it is about our future and our world is a fragile place. We want to make sure it's safe, just, clean and viable for future generations. It's up to all of us to look after it. Thank you. Sue, so, thank you very much. That is a deeply reflective process you have brought us through from the environmental uh, Samaritan through our own fears to the pivotal shifts, the justice, as you say, in the economy, the symbiosine that we can create a vision as community as to where we need to go. And you give us that question of what is in our minds and our hearts that will form our response to the mission. So thank you deeply. Let's just take a, just a few seconds for that, just to soak in, maybe make some notes for a minute before we go to Lisa.
Now, may I ask uh, Lisa to uh, be able, may she share the screen to share her PowerPoint? Um, we're very uh, interested in what you will share in terms of the youth and the youth ministry and creation. So thank you, Lisa. Okay, Father, I will share my screen. Wait a minute, because there's an error. Yes. Okay, I hope my PowerPoint will share. Can you see further yes. my PowerPoint? Yes, okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Good uh, morning, Father and the conference participant in Zoom and also in YouTube. Um, it is an honor for me uh, to share my experience for you all here. And I will present about youth and the pandemic. Actually, um, during this pandemic, I was in Austria, in Vienna, for quarantine at home around one month, uh, from the mid of March until the April. But the situation makes me more engaged with Indonesia because of online. So I have a lot of meetings with people in Indonesia like creating something to help Indonesia, such as online campaign, uh, giving awareness of the dangers of COVID-19 to Indonesian society. And also I have uh, the National Voluntary Tax Force of COVID-19, or in Bahasa is Relawan Gugus Tugas Nasional in Indonesia for Communication Divis Division. So I have a jargon. This is my jargon besides um, finding God in all things. And my jargon, uh, I have a mind free, although my body is isolated. And I choose this situation as a gift, not a disaster. So um, I choose to give more for, for others. Uh, that's why um, I am a voluntary as an animator of Young Catholic Student of ICS Indonesia. I accompany student, animator, and chaplain from five different province with different islands are Jakarta, Pontianak, Indre, Kupang, and Manado. We have around like 30, uh, uh, 300 students for this community. Particularly in Jakarta, we are using formation of Ignatian leadership. And the YCS is the international community that is central in Paris and the central in Asia in the Philippines. Besides that, I also the community, community, uh, committee of the Youth Commission Indonesian Bishop Conference. We create the program for Catholic young people in Indonesia, such as training for social media admin from uh, 37 dioceses in Indonesia, and then doing also online seminar at etc. And also I joined the Magis community in uh, 2010 until 2012. And I'm grateful of that because until now I live in the Ignatian spirituality that can make me more for others through my service activities. And this is the example of my activities. Um, the first one is uh, the, the program from the Indonesian Bishop Conference and then the second one from the YCS in Indonesia. This is during the pandemic. Okay, so before I answer this question from the community, uh, I want to share you about the youth characteristic. Um, basically, uh, the age of young people in Catholic Church is 15 until 35 years old. So it is named 
adolescence and adulthood. These are the combining, uh, the component of them based on intellectuality, emotionally, and social life. The first one about the intellectuality. The adolescence has the characteristic of rational and systematic thinking. So they always questioning everything, includes this pandemic situation until they find answer rationally. Then they try to arrange it systematically and the positive result they can create the something for solving the problems. In this stage, uh, they have idealism and try to solve with their idealism. But the adulthood has the thinking system more realistic because they know the field situation and they have more experience than adolescents. So they act more flexible than the adolescents. And the second one about their emotionally. The adolescents has the feeling emotions differently and intensively. So the youth can feel the emotion mix up. Uh, the example like they watch the Korean movie with the happy and sad feeling together and are getting more deep intensively. That's why they can confuse about anything more intensive than before. I mean, than, uh, than before, I mean, than when they are a child. Then adulthood have the optimum mental function because meet the demands of career, marriage, and children. So they have the emotion more calm and thinking for the future. The third one about social life. The adolescents exploring their personal and social sense personal value, work environment, and education. Of course, the adulthood has the characteristic more independent than the adolescence. Based on this characteristic, I want to answer this question from the committee of this conference, the first one about how has COVID-19 affected youth in Asia Pacific? And then the second one, what is likely to be emerging or new situation regarding youth in Asia Pacific? And I try to answer the third one, uh, what are the implications, opportunities, priorities, demands for mission of the Society of Jesus in Asia Pacific? For answering this question, I did online survey for students, young people, animator and chaplain from YCS, Magis community, and Eucharist youth movement in some countries in Asia Pacific. And this is the result. Okay, the first one about how has COVID-19 affected youth in Asia Pacific? From the youth animator perspective, I define the answer for five categories. The first one, psychological. Uh, there are two things affected. The first one, positive. Uh, the positive is uh, forcing them to adapt all the activities such as academic and non-academic online quickly. Uh, like the student from Indonesia will do online learning until the end of this year. And also the non-academic activities such as training or seminar for building their capability. The second one, thinking creatively for doing something with the community such as creating movement in social media, including for environment. Uh, the example like YCS from Sri Lanka, India, and Indonesia did the campaign for nature in social media, like planting some plan, and then they recorded in video and then uploaded in the YouTube. And the third one, um, creating empathy with others, particularly on poor people. The example during this pandemic, YCS Indonesia making donation for poor people in slum area in Jakarta, uh, the place that they did live in for five, four days before the pandemic. And then the last one about feeling the emotional intensively with family. Because they stay at home, so they will more deeply feeling the emotional with their family. The positive way, they can grow more positive than usual because they make intensive communication with their parents, their sister or brother. But the negative way, if the family is not a well support system, so it can, it can make them depressed. 
like those lists of negative effect of psychological. The first one, uh, they feeling depressed of monotone activities and cannot meet their friends physically. This situation contrary with the characteristic of young people who is like hang out with their friend. of relationship with their friends because of they cannot meet each other more intensive than before so um, they do not really know about their friend condition now the third one stay at home without much work they are already bored in this situation make them more lazy and doing nothing along the day or in bahasa mager malas gerak and the fourth one, being immersed and addicted to the internet. Because the one and only tools during this situation is internet. So if they have not the capability to balance their needs, they can addict it to the internet. And then next, uh, they feeling fear, panic, and anxieties. Because they confusing about their future, such as in academic way. I will explain after this. And the last one, quarrels or violence in families. Most of them violence through verbal, such as the parent push them to keep their performance, to keep their achievement, whereas they're facing up the difficulties to understand the material. And then the, uh, the academic, they are, they cannot follow and understanding the online learning. So they are not convinced about their study results because during the class, um, they unmute audio and also video, or maybe the signal was not good. The second one, less motivated for online learning because of they lost concentration or they live in the rural place that internet does not yet exist. The, the third one, confusing how to learn because they have less interaction with their teacher or lecturer. So sometimes the teacher or lecturer should be like, ask the informal things before the class personally, uh, such as, how are you? And then it can, it can make them happy. And the fourth, uh, drop the academic semester in the university the school and left the city. Most of them, because of financial things, they cannot pay the study again because their parents lost job. Not only the youth, uh, such as in Yogyakarta, they are also children in kindergarten cannot continue the learning process because of their parents have not money to pay the school. And the next aspect is spiritual. There are the online mass makes the missing of the Holy Sacrament because they only praying on spiritual communion. The second one, uh, besides that, the young people cannot concentrate and participate actively. They have asked um, me, uh, is the mass can skip on the homily part and then directly to the consecration part? And um, the third one about faithlessness for not having spiritual exercise in the church. Sometimes they pray with the sleeping pools. And then the fourth one, due to frustration such as loss of job, um, making them more dependent on God. This is the good one. Or they can step away from God because of that kind of problem. And then the aspect of physical, uh, they eat a lot balancing with the exercise side. Particularly the youth who is living in the apartment with the limited space for doing exercise. And then they're also sleeping, gaming, feeding the movie in much time. So makes them lazy. And the, th the third one, physical problem due to having no field to play. Just only online as placing for playing. And then the last one, the financial, loss of jobs many of youth and also their parents and they cannot buy internet data for learning at home such as the student from rural Kalimantan or Borneo 
they are not not enough for signal so they try to find the signal in the forest uh, near river upon the tree etc so based on the survey um, i see the important things is the youth spending much time in digital media including the country with high or low rate infected of COVID-19. And these are the testimonial of the student and chaplain of uh, the YCS. Uh, Rainer from YCS Indonesia said that uh, this year with a COVID-19 pandemic around the world, it is challenged for me as a Catholic youth. All activities and plans made for this year are hampered, starting from study activities and also organizational events. In terms of spirituality, it is also taste in this condition. The inability to receive the Holy Sacrament as a whole creates a longing in itself. It makes us realize how important the Catholic Holy Communion is. And then Father Anil, the chaplain of EYCS Asian, said that this pandemic situation affected youth for spirituality, such as not comfortable doing mentoring online. Emotionally, such as depression because of lost job and relationship, so they only hope for God. And physically, such as they only eat food that balancing with the exercise. And then also testimony Neil, from the brother Ujal chaplain of YCS Bangladesh say that the pandemic situation has created psychological, academic, physical, and financial problems among the youths in Bangladesh. Many of us have already experienced the, the negative impact of COVID-19 among the youths. Okay, and then I try to answer the second question. What is likely to be emerging or new situation regarding youth in Asia Pacific? I answer with the two perspectives. The first one, shadow, and then the, 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 the next is likes. The shadow part, uh, individualistic attitude, such as egoism. So they just do something because of their benefit. The second one, social media dependence, such as they consuming the false information. The third one, lack of initiative to get involved in church activities, uh, such as they being passive in the community. The third one, faith life will be chance and gap between the church and the young people. Like um, I heard a question from my friend that should I join the offline mass if there is an online mass? So the church should aware and ready for this condition for balancing the online and online the offline and online services. And then the life part, the first one. They helpful to the poor and needy, like being voluntary or making donation. The second one, kind to the nature, like they make online cam campaign for environment. The third one, caring for the family, such as they helping the parents, such as cooking, farming, etc. And the last one about this disciplined life, so they making a deadline for their works. So this is the testimonial from the YCS student. Malin Fa, student of YCS Sri Lanka, said that, actually in Sri Lanka, there was not a high rate for COVID-19 infected, but we did all the activities online from March until June, 2020. And for keeping our friends touch with God, we send spiritual message throughout WhatsApp groups during the quarantine period. And then the testimonial from Gator Deng, student of YCS Taiwan, said that from February to June, we didn't get together with each other because of COVID-19 until July and August as the pandemic subsided, lots of things returned to normal. We got together did some relaxing things and update our reason life. So then I try to answer the third question. What are the implications 
opportunities, priorities, demands for mission of the Society of Jesus in Asia Pacific. And this is the result. Uh, the first one about connecting people through the internet, including social media, to share God's warmth in more creative way and letting them feel they are not alone. The second one, adapting activities in ministry by optimizing in technology, such as making extracurricular activities for students. The third one, revitalizing youth ministry through online, such as like in my uh, university doing leadership formation online. Okay, and then um, I find the important things also like the first one, no digital media is a must. So I want to propose this kind of formation program is social media literacy formation. Because based on the data, based on the global data in 2020, in the Asia Pacific, the total population is uh, 4.30 billion people. And they all connecting with, with the mobile phone, around 4.4 3 billion people, but a half of them have already using internet and active using social media. And every year, the, the data increase, just as the population increase a 0.8%, and then connecting mobile phone increase 3.5%, and then internet using uh, increase like 9.2%. And the most increasing is using social media, like 9.8%. And the most platform that they use in social media, Facebook. And then the most country have the biggest social media user are India, China, and Indonesia. These are the countries in Asia Pacific um, and the spend time using using mobile is day is three hours forty minutes. Increasing of people using gadgets is ten percent. People using mobile application around ninety percent, and increasing of mobile time spent using a web browser such as Google.com is nine percent. So every year, the data of mobile time by activity always increasing. So I propose this one, social media literacy formation uh, is the ability of user to interpret, reproduce, evaluate, and apply the new content in the digital environment. So they can fully capitalize on technology, integrate the critical aspect, make analysis and conduct an evaluation to create influential and constructive message, and then spread them to people. The basis of this ability is critical thinking. And I applied this formation to my program in the Bishop Conference Youth Commission. The name is Youth Creative Academy. This training of trainers for 120 admin social media from 37 dioceses in Indonesia. This program held by Youth Commission Indonesian Bishop Conference with goals to be a tool of Catholic young people for self actualization session in a creative field by using tools of their community or organization social media. So we give the material are analyzing the situation and critical thinking, making segmentation, targeting and positioning, digital marketing and public relations, copywriting, creating content of graphic and video. And also I implement the Ignatian spirituality here, spirituality here during the online session. So after they get the, the material, we always reflections with with the tools name is Mentimeter. So I think that's all. Thank you. Um, the Pope Francis said that social network is fully human forms of communication. It is built a society which is healthy and open to sharing. So let's act responsibly to promote the positive use of the net. Thank you, Father Pedro. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, and thank you both for keeping to the time. Um, it's been very helpful today, but again, you have brought us through so much in terms of from starting with the characteristics of the youth. Um, the testimonies were very 
good to hear. And then we looked at animation, at the animators. Um, and uh, I think this uh, gives us ideas as well and uh, an understanding as to how we can connect and what the challenges are. Um, and uh, what we have to be realistic about. Um, your conclusion there with so the uh, social media literacy um, has got some very nice insights, I feel, for us. And again, watching how the hours go up and how the need for critical thinking and analysis as a skill. So I thank you very much. Um, the, my suggestion at this stage is we take a 10 minute break, if that is acceptable. Adri, is that okay? And we come back in 10 minutes. Um, I leave you according to your own clocks for that, but it's 10.58 here. And, uh. Let's come back with some questions, uh, particularly from the uh, social apostolate context of how we really uh, seek to draw from these two rich presentations. Thank you. Great.
No, okay. I don't know if people are coming back there. How are we doing? I see a lot of photo faces there, so I'm not sure we're back yet, Lisa. Okay, the first frame is filling up with faces, very good. That's good. Okay. Okay, can we, can I, I think from the screen, I'm seeing most people, I won't say most, yes, maybe most are now back. So maybe we can pick up on the, the questions. Um, I would uh, suggest um, we start with Sue. I think most of you have the questions in front of you there, but if I just select them so that we can go through, I'm watching the time. Um, connected. I, I love the Taiha D. Shadan um, notion that we love earth, we love God, we love earth through God and uh, receive that grace from earth that uh, Taihad de Shadan talks about. Um, so for me, ecological conversion is different, but um, it's, it, it's for me broadening the, the love that I have, the love for other. So the love for um, um, to see justice across our communities but that justice goes deep to love of of earth and place so um yes i think i think they are they are different and i did put something in the Would chat yeah sorry pedro You put in integral ecology has both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor interconnected. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, the, and that's from Laudato C. So for me, that that um, integral. We need to um, hear the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. And, and so for me, that's that's very important. I hope that answered that question. You had two images up in your presentation. So one of the Anthropocene and the human at the center of everything. Yes. Uh, with the scripture of domination. And then you had another one where we were part of that creation. And I think those two dimensions of scripture um, illustrate the challenge you present us with, in a sense. If I may suggest the second part of that question, um, is it wrong to think that we focus on the care of the earth primarily for the sake of alleviating the suffering of our brothers and sisters and for creating a more just future? No, it's all integral. It's all connected. You can't do one without the other. And, and, and it's first peoples. You know, first peoples are so important in that story. So, um, yes, it's, it's, about, it's about being open to, for me, um, connecting who, with, with your place and with your people. And then hopefully, um, locally, then hopefully globally, it grows. So think global, act local is my, yeah. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. I think that also responds to the end of the question there 
the value of nature in itself. It's not separating things out, it's finding the integral meaning. Um, for so there's a, somebody wanted to understand more fully uh, the ecological economic models. So perhaps you could say something briefly, but perhaps also you could share at a later stage some of the articles that explain that. Yes, I'm, I'm very but, happy to do that. I'm not an ecological economic um, expert, um, but just yeah. sharing from my colleagues Hayden and Michelle. And um, for me, that table um, really bringing out that we need to think about growth if we are to be true to um, Earth as um, so. Um, I'm very happy to maybe share that um, where that came from. Would that would that be good? Yes. I'll, I'll send that yeah. to Andrew. I, yeah, I think working with that x and y axis of your table, yeah, that they made shows you what's being covered and. It also shows you what energy is behind this. Um, yes, and, I also and the other one was population. I didn't mention, but population and um, how we can live with Earth is important. Hmm. Yeah, I think the first one on that column was actually population. Yes. yes. On the axis, and the other dimension of that is. Um, the SDGs were developed in the old financial paradigm. So they also will need a level of adaptation. Yep. Um, yep. A further question here, Sue, is can you share some examples of how people in your country have been doing some symbiotic collaborations with nature that show the truth of what uh, Vandana Shiva uh, stated before. I love Vandana Shiva. I, I love her work. It's uh, um, so for us in Australia, we are on a regenerative agriculture uh, mission. I did mention um, permaculture there, which is that notion of permanent agriculture and um, permaculture it is a movement that anybody can do to have uh, food in their backyard or food, um, uh, food security, thinking about uh, growing, growing your own. And um, uh, regenerative ag is new. It's, um, it's, it's growing and it's looking at landscape, agriculture within the landscape that more suits it and um, having water move and stay in a landscape. Within Australia, we're very dry. Water is our issue. The Murray-Darling Basin is um, a lament. Um, and so for me, um, that notion of um, agroecology, which uh, Vanda Vananda Shiva talks about is is really important and and a place that I hope our reconciliation with creation team can grow, um, take on and use and so yes I agree with those statements and I I just think um, this is a space that will be exciting Rege regenerative agriculture if I could get the words out. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I hope uh, Paolo Spiriono that um, is uh, an initial response to you. Um, before I switch to Lisa, let me just ask one more of the questions here, Sue. Uh, we're very busy today with questions from Louis Bacomo. What possibilities of dialogue perhaps have arisen between economic and ecology-centered models. 
are there hopeful signs towards? So again, um, again, I'm not an a, an economist. I'm I'm an agronomist actually by by trade and an educator by profession. Um, and I I love that the ecos is home and ecology the study of life and economy how we operate our society are all based in that same word so home and um, without home we don't have economy we don't have um, uh, so uh, they might they do talk they 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 do talk but uh, for me those in power don't understand those limits to growth. So it, it's those shifts, those shifts in, um, those pivotal shifts in how we have um, a new economy, it is going to be critical. And whether or not this catastrophe is the opportunity for that shift, I'm not sure, but collectively, we can we can make um, collectively we can help shift uh, the world conversation around economies. So I apologise. I'm not I'm not going to be that expert on economies, but just acknowledge that ecos is what it's about. Thank you, Sue. I think it relates to one of the points you held up uh, in the global discussions in Echo Jesuit, that there are certain centers globally in finance that are beginning to talk of putting ecology and economy, and therefore the carrot stick for, regener uh, for moving the economy in the coming months is to put the financial emphasis on the non-carbon side. Um, obviously, that's only a few countries, um, but they are major movers in the economic framework. Um, and uh, banking paradigm is actually challenged to change. So I hope, yeah, uh, we will see more from that world map of yours of North Thank and you. South. Yes. Thank you, Sue. I think there are a few more questions. We will come back to you, but uh, let me uh, try to find the first question there that was coming up in relation to Lisa, uh, and um, we see where we can go from there. Okay. Um, uh, I don't. So, yes, Lisa, have you got one mm -hmm. there? Uh, yeah. Vincent was writing. Um, yes. What do you hope? by presenting the data. Um, do you think that online evangelical work to the youth is a must? Yes. So, all yours. That the using of internet, particularly on social media, always increasing. So uh, it is designed for us for doing something not just letting the youth using the social media without guidance. So let's try to embracing the social media with the youth. That's the first one and setting. And then the second one, um, I think yes, um, for coping the youth that using social media, because uh, during I accompany uh, the youth in the social media, when they confusing, they always see in the social media. For example, in Instagram, in Indonesia, we have some catechism, uh, social media like Catholic media, Catholic Bigram, Hits or MK, something like that. They always are posting about the catechism in the social media. And that's how for the youth to find the answer when they confusing, when they depressed. And sometimes they chat with the admin of social media and try to um, sharing what, what they feel. So they find it in the social media. That's the most point. Um, and 
any other solution for the offline one uh yes um during this pandemic the youth still need uh like mentoring or the sharing with the peer so i think uh we can we can do that in the offline uh, the offline area and then i think that's one for answering one thing for vincent father pedro thank you thank you i hope that helps um a further question there from adriadas adrianas is how we should serve the excluded youth who do not have access to online platform have you got thoughts on that uh, okay um actually i have an experience um from kalimantan because they do not have like signal something like that and then uh we speak with the animator there and then we try to make an offline a mentoring or cell meeting offline uh because the most point the most point problem the youth is psychological of course i want to answer the uh question from i forgot from johannes ekra priyatma about the lower at the lower uh, the lower youth also the most point is a physiological but when they did uh, in the lower uh, i mean that the lower uh, the youth the most point is economic but after the economic the fastest one is in, in is the physiological so maybe we can make uh, the solution from the psychological uh, aspect like uh, doing sales meetings uh, and also mentoring for them thank you father okay thank you um uh, another question here is without critical analyzation are we really okay to be involved with huge internet capitalism such as uh gafa i know we have no choices but still i am wondering how to keep proper distance with gafa okay so the critical thinking is a must for the social media literacy or media literacy or digital literacy and also the unesco uh, provide that module for uh being literate for the young people in all over the world and without critical thinking uh the the young people just re, they, they cannot produce a well well filter because they just only share comment something like that and they they do not know how to analyze the situation and also how to reflect the situation to produce the positive and impactful things to others so i think the critical thinking is a must thank you father okay um and have you any uh, comment on the the gaff do you want to can someone explain what gaff is gaff g a f f um I think that's uh, is, just an acronym for yeah. all the that's an acronym for Google and all the social media platforms. Yeah. Thank you. The Google, <laughs> Apple, Facebook, Amazon. Ah. ah okay. Amazon. Yeah. Okay, that's American yeah. so project, that's right? <laughs> around the world. Yes. It's a common it's just a common acronym, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So um have have you have you a comment on that in terms of how people get drawn into this huge economy that is a multi billion dollar yeah consumption um while we're trying to do ordinary things so we're challenged to strike a balance with that I can't think which one of them has now taken the biggest financial ownership in the world amazon yeah. 
Amazon, yeah. So we all need to think about that. Lisa, there's another question here for you. Uh, it seems that the context you use to understand youth in this pandemic is from middle to higher income uh, class society. Do you have an idea on how to help young people who are from the lower class? Partly you, was, you were mentioning that in dealing with this pandemic. So you were talking about the financial and the psychological. Yep. Um, yep. Yep. Like yeah, I said before, so other, I like I said before, other, uh, the most, the most thing is the psychological. Even they, they coping with the financial problems. But uh, after that, the best one is the psychological. So like they want to release the situation because when the financial problem comes to them, and then they feeling depressed, and then they do not do not know how to coping that problem. So. Uh, we try to um, make like uh, the groups in the cell meeting for the for the young people. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think um, as I scroll this, we've gone through most of the questions here. Uh, Louis Bacomo was also asking whether. There are other people experienced in working with, um, yeah, marginal youth. Um, I don't know if there are other people there who have comment or if there are some other questions people would like to raise. Um, so, uh, Vanessa has put in a point here. In yesterday's discussion, a point was made about the role of the home in fostering intimacy in distance learning. What are your ideas about training parents in social media or media literacy in general? Okay. Actually, it could be easy uh, training for the youth than the parents because um, the youth will be open for training and uh, being literate than the, than the parents. But our government in Indonesia have the module also for the parents. They have a guidance for the parents how to be literate in the social media. And besides that, the youth are like um, sharing to me, uh, they feel not comfortable when they want to call, clarify uh, the parents uh, who uh, spread the hoax message. So they ask how, 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 how I uh, to, be, to communicate to my parents when they spread the hoax to the people. So they have been confusing about that. So I try to explain that you can communicate with the empathy assertive communication with the with your parents because you know how to communicate with them okay uh but i focus in the youth people i think that's all father okay i don't know if i can say something um i'm living in an area where we don't have uh, but for me here, uh, Wi-Fi in the rest of the valley. Um, I have 400 students. Uh, all they want to do is get together. Um, so it's uh, extremely hard to meet that need. So we're going around the villages, uh, distributing information, mainly finding out how people are because there are many other sicknesses uh, and problems other than covid it hasn't arrived here um, and one of the biggest problems is the harvest at the moment uh, urban areas i think are much worse off than rural areas we at least have uh, the food uh, People's work has been transitory outside, so at least they can come home. 
I don't know if people can talk from urban areas, from Manila, from Jakarta, uh, uh, yeah, from Bangkok, any of the cities. What, what's the experience there for the youth and for the environment? Okay, uh, could you simply pass the question, Father? Um, are there other people who can share from uh, urban context as to what is happening to youth and how people are thinking about the environment they want to move into, particularly from the poor areas? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the question is the same like before, Father, about the financial problem? Um, it's really ad addressing the, the, the youth needs. I'm opening it up to anyone who wants to speak from... I'm talking from rural poverty, if you like, and the problems. Um, what are the urban problems and possibilities that people see? Uh, Father Pedro, Elvin here from uh, Malaysia. Can I just share a little bit from my perspective? Yes, thank you. Okay, um, basically working in an urbanized uh, Malaysian city, the, the whole idea of, uh, I think we have to recognize that the term youth is very broad and that there are multiple layers that we have to unpack. Yeah, between first and foremost, urban youth versus uh, rural youth. And of course, the question of accessibility to the internet. Uh, although nowadays I can imagine that even the most, uh, most youth would have some kind of connection to the, uh, to the web, yeah, one way or another. But just to answer the question very quickly, I think even before the pandemic, uh, unskilled youth, those who are anything above of 16 and above have dropped out from schools and those who have migrated from the rural areas to the cities to look for jobs, they are already in a very, very vulnerable position of being exploited. And I'm only talking about citizens, yeah, Malaysian citizens who find jobs in construction, but most particularly in the tourism industry, because this is where they can move in and out very fluidly. That means uh, either working as a waitressing at a table or just, you know, a bellboy in a hotel, you get the idea. Uh, then the pandemic came along and, you know, tourism is the first sector to be hit hard. And so many of them found themselves suddenly without that sort of security. And I do not know about the other participants' experience, but my, understand, my, my sense here in Malaysia is that the youth do not save money. They, they don't really believe in putting money in the bank so much as investing whatever they've earned into gadgets, into, you know, uh, this is typical of youth, you know, it's not, a, it's not to fault, find or to, to blame them in anything, but they invest in very literal, uh, immediate gratification uh, of things in terms of clothes and gadgets. So when they are without a job suddenly, many of them find themselves at a loss. So the, there are only two options. If they are from the rural areas to go back home and live off the parents, uh, those in the urban areas will just stay at home and try to find some meaning out of the whole thing. But the prolongation of the pandemic has now surfaced new issues. I think in the first three months, people were willing to write it out. But now with the prolongation going into an unknown future, Many of the youth find themselves, as uh, the speaker, uh, Ms. Lisa, has stated, uh, in depression. Many of them do not feel motivated to work. And if they do work, they think that they can get a work that will pay in the same amount of uh, uh, in the remuneration they used to get before. But now, employers have the upper hand. So uh, those youth, especially those who are unskilled, are in an even worse position than before. So. Uh, in Malaysia, many have turned to becoming delivery, uh, food delivery uh, people. You know, uh, food delivery has gone up exponentially. So those with a vehicle, anything like a car or a motorcycle would sign up. That, was the, that would be the first thing they do, basically. 
And then those technically savvy youths will turn to the internet and start making videos through YouTube to try to get income. But I will stop there and say that the difference is between citizens and non-citizens because in where I come from, we have a lot of youths from Indonesia who've come from Kalimantan, I mean Sarawak by the way. So many of them are stuck here in the city. They can't go back because the borders are closed. They have no skills. They have very little to offer in terms of negotiating for better rights and they would be uh, mostly highly exploited. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we hear from some other people, some other countries, what your questions are, what your uh, challenges are? Because tomorrow we will begin to look at uh, the mission. Julie want to say something with you. Julie? Sorry? Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Pedro and everyone, thanks very much and thanks for the great presentations. Um, yes, just talking about, you know, the situation, um, Jesuit Social Services uh, works mostly um, in cities, uh, though in Northern Territory, um, we're working with Aboriginal communities uh, in remote situations. But uh, just around the, I wanted to really tap into about the issue about young people and um, the digital divide, really. We've uh, got a little working group at the moment looking specifically at this because um, our experience is that for some uh, children, uh, that is people under 18 um, and young people, they've, some have done quite well um, in that they had problems socially at school, um, they were getting bullied or were bullying, etc. So for some people, they've done well, but we've also noticed that, like others, that the um, COVID-19 experience has really shone a light on the divide in many ways, and in this case, on the digital divide. Um, so there's a few points that um, we'd say, the lack of access to the internet or data and or the technology and hardware, Second, the lack of digital skills and confidence, which goes to what Lisa was saying. Third, the existing, existing literacy and numeracy challenges, making digital learning harder to achieve. Um, so they come to it with perhaps without those basic literacy, literacy skills. And lack of confidence in engaging uh, with the digital world and feelings of shame. Now, this is Australia, you know, first world country, if you want to use that terminology, but we still have that digital divide. We know that at the moment in Melbourne, we've been, um, schools have been closed for a while, we're in lockdown, and we know that it might be a ho one house may have one device, for example, and or so there's a bit of fighting about who's got that for school. Now, the Victorian government has done, it has offered assistance, but it's not smooth just to make sure you can get another, like an iPad, etc. And then it, that's the, uh, you might have the device, but you may not have access. So I suppose just giving a bit of a glimpse, Pedro, I needn't say more, but just to say from another perspective, a city in a, a wealthy country, uh, the digital divide is still um, there. And I just want to say one other thing. What we've noticed, we've been teaching a bit, like Lisa was saying, this critical thinking because we noticed that a lot of the young people that we work with actually think that what they're getting across their social feed, uh, feeds, media feeds, is the news, is actually what's happening. They haven't distinguished. So um, we thought that they were very would be very literate around um, accessing information. They're not. They only get what comes into them. Thank you. Hello. Great. That gives us very much uh, uh, an amount to reflect on for today as we move towards uh, Friday. Um, I know that uh, Christina is going to give us some orientation for Friday, um, but uh, I'm wondering, Adri, 
do you want to say anything or you want to ask anything of the group before we transition? Yes, thank you, Petru. If it is possible, the organizing uh, team members, we can stay for a while for evaluation after this meeting. And secondly, I already share all present presentations in the chatting, so you can download from there. Otherwise, you can email me and then I, I will send to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we can move to Sue. Uh, sorry, we can move to Christina um, to give us uh, a new uh, focus on Friday. Hey. Thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, I like uh, uh, Pedro's uh, uh, suggestion just now. Let's spend just a few seconds in silence uh, to appreciate uh, what we've just heard. Uh, appreciate each other's presence and, and the really earnest intentions and the presence of God in these two, two three days as well. Okay, uh, some orientations for Friday. Uh, first, before I go there, first of all, uh, thanks very much for all your birthday wishes. I can't think of a, a better uh, a, a way to spend my birthday with, with companions that really mean a lot to me. Uh, so because of that, I'm, give, I'm going to give you more work to do. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, you have given such wonderful uh, sharing after Monday. We, we got to hear uh, your stories from wherever you are, and it's so helpful. So uh, uh, I'm, uh, we are going to uh, request uh, uh, that you also give a similar uh, feedback uh, today. Please email me once again by today uh, um, if, if you, um, especially, you know, uh, to share your views uh, how it has how COVID has affected number one the youth and number two the ecological situation uh, in your country in your wherever you are. Uh, once again, I will send an email right after this so that uh, you have the questions at hand. Uh, so that's uh, to uh, uh, revert uh, uh, hopefully by the end of today. Secondly. Uh, after that, I uh, would like to invite you to, uh, or we would like to have for all of us to really make a time of prayer and reflection uh, because it really goes uh, back down to our uh, identity and mission and our being uh, collaborators with God in this really all important time, uh, what, what, what we, we can uh, be and what we can do. So three questions for prayer. Uh, what strikes me? How am I moved? Uh, what calls do we hear? Um, so uh, that when we start on Friday morning, uh, you already have uh, some fruits from your prayer to share. Uh, I will, again, uh, I will also send uh, these uh, questions uh, to you uh, in email right after this. On Friday morning, uh, we will come together in plenary. Uh, we will share some simple instructions and then we will start immediately with spiritual conversation in small groups. Uh, um, we will probably put together those who are in more or less the similar ministries so that you can share uh, with one another. Uh, and then uh, the second half of the session, we will come back in plenary and we'll hear from one another. So on the Friday, there are no more uh, presentations from speakers, but it's really uh, to hear one another, uh, to continue to get a sense of how the Spirit is moving us, speaking to us, and what, what could be a, a next step that we can take as a conference. That's all. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, I don't think there's uh, any more I need to say at this stage. I think you can continue to share questions with people. Uh, people will still be willing to answer um, and also to share materials. Um, so this can help us continue beyond this week. Um, anyone else uh, want to say anything before Friday? The rest, I think a few of us will stay behind. So with that, um, I would like to thank you uh, for participating in this. And I hope uh, it gives us the hope and the strength um, to focus on the ministry. Thank you. And good noon here.